Greetings, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another edition of Ranking the Albums. Today, I've got Martin Popoff in the co-captain's chair Absolutely. for a little discussion of new wave of British heavy metal legends, Angel Witch. Absolutely, yeah. Pretty Very cool good. band. Not a big catalog, but um, yeah. sometimes the shorter catalogs are kind of the best. Sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes. So, uh, so this band, uh, I don't know, Martin, um, I'm not good on my exact dates, but did these guys come out before Maiden? Saxon obviously predated them. I think Def Leppard predated them. I'm trying to think of that. Maiden. Actually, Maiden's first album probably came out a little bit before. Um, well, I'll, 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 I'll bail you out on the dates because I actually just kind of looked some stuff up earlier. Because I did, I did these books, which are a timeline book of the new wave of British oh, yeah. metal, right? So we got this one ends in 82 or something, 81. And this one goes 82 to 84. So I just quickly looked up in these because, you know, when we when we talk about that album behind me here, and there's the first one where I reviewed all the singles and all the, uh, so it's a trilogy. And so I looked it up and basically, because I wanted to talk about the excitement I felt when um, that first single, The Sweet Danger Flight 19. So that one is May 80. And, and, and you know, also I, I refreshed my memory they started as Lucifer in 1977. They started recording in 78. They're playing already in 79. So they've got the May 80 awesome single. They've got the October 80 awesome single, Angel Witch. And uh, what, what, is, what is on the other side of Angel Witch? Hang on, I wrote it down there. Uh, Angel Witch is with Gorgon. Sweet, Sweet Danger is with Flight 19, October 80. And then the album, the awesome album, comes out December 80. So they're right in there all the same time as Maiden, essentially. They're on the, um, they're on the you know, the first sampler that essentially started it all with uh, Baphomet, which isn't even on the uh, album, right? Yep. And, you know, this is, this is the record that famously made Maiden famous with Sanctuary. Maiden gets on twice with Sanctuary and Wrathchild on the first metal from others, right? So, uh, so yeah, they're, they're right in there, right at the beginning, making awesome music at the beginning. But I think, uh, I have a feeling both of us are going to be talking about that awesome music a little later in this episode, right? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> and, and the only reason I started bringing up dates and questioning things is that, you know, for those of you who maybe have not listened to this band much or at all, there's a lot of characteristics, especially on that first album, that the kind of the metal genre seemed to chump, uh, churn out quite a bit in the years to follow. And I know a lot of these sort of things, like, you know, the galloping rhythms and drumming and the, the guitar style and all that kind of stuff, Maiden gets a lot of credit for that. So I think the reason why I bring it up is because you hear a lot of those things on some of these early albums and even their more later albums. And so it, it got me thinking the other day, it's like, well, who kind of created all Who was the first to do these? Or did, were they all just kind of messing around in this style at the same time and they just, it just kind of leaked from one band to the other? I don't know. Does it really matter? Probably not. But I just think it's kind of cool to kind of go back in, in history of this movement of metal and to hear all of these little musical elements that are now things that we take for granted, right? And well, yeah, and also, you know, we, we always think of the new wave of British heavy metal having this, this hard beginning at the, at the beginning of 1980. But, you know, all these bands, as I was flipping through that book, looking at, you know, what, was, what they were all doing in the 70s, Raven and Witchbind and Maiden, of course, we know Maiden goes back to 74-ish, right? So a lot of these bands are incubating this new, you know, heavier style of metal, you know, based maybe a little bit inspired by the likes of uh, Rainbow Rising and what Judas Priest is doing and Motorhead is doing, but they're they're incubating all this stuff for for a good five years before before they kick off. Just like most bands, right? Sure, so sure. it's really commendable that uh, that you know this this new heavier music was being written in seventy six, seventy seven, seventy eight, leading up to it. So yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So we got uh, five albums here, not a big okay. catalog, and uh, we're going to kind of rank them in the uh, order that we like them. And uh, I will say, mm -hmm. pretty, five pretty damn good albums. Some yeah. a little bit better than others, but uh, I think they all bring quite a bit to the table. So I'll have Martin kick us okay. off with his number five. So my first one is Frontal Assault. Uh, I'm sorry I don't own a copy anymore. I, I, it's a long story. I have friends come over to my office over the years begging me to buy things off of me, and then, then they go, right? I, I definitely owned all this stuff at once. But So Frontal Assault, 
I'm picking as my number five. Um, I looked on Wiki and I, I'm quoted there as giving it a number six in, or a six out of 10 in Wiki. I played it again and it's a, it's a solid seven, I would say. But the problem is the songs are even better than a solid seven, but the production is really harsh, right? This, uh, this, this, you know, they're on Killer Watt Records now. They're they're down off the major label. This is their second one um, on on Killer Watt. It's 1986. Um, the songs are really good. I mean, it's still it's still vintage Kevin Hayborn writing on this, but but the um, yeah, the, the production is super harsh. Um, they're trying some other things. You know, the lineup's already compromised. David Tatum is the vocalist now. Um, you know, he's he reminds me of a cross between Kevin Hayborn and maybe uh, Peter Golby from from Your Eye Heap. Um, not crazy about his vocals. He's got kind of a lower range on him. Uh, I really like that Kevin Hayborn sound. Um, but yeah, still a pretty good album. They've lost Dave Hogg as drummer on this one. So they've got Spencer Hallman, but they've still got Peter uh, Gordelier uh, in there. Um, melodic, a little commercial, but again, like really buzz sawing um, uh, sort of guitars. And yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's 1986. It, it just doesn't fit in the world at this point, this, this cool Gothic, you know, pretty early sounding new wave of British heavy metal. So yeah, it's my number five, but still a pretty good album. Yeah, I agree with this. My number five as well. And I don't have a copy of it either. Um, yeah. Really murky production. I mean, it's, yeah. it's funny. I think on this album and the one that uh, came before it, it's just, yeah. The production did it no favors whatsoever. And I, I sense a little bit of kind of like commercial sheen coming into the music on this album, which not surprising because most bands of that era were starting to kind of take those things in a little bit. But still some really good songs. I mean, Rendezvous with the Blade, really good track. Uh, take to the Wings, Something Wrong. Under Gods is a terrific song. Yeah, I don't mind David Tatum's vocals. I kind of prefer Kevin Hayborn's. It's for some reason, his voice just really always fit the music of this band really, really well. But David's not a bad singer either. I thought uh, his vocals were pretty fine on, on both albums. And yeah, like you said, some really nice crushing riffs on this album, as on most of these. And I think we're probably going to talk about it more as we go on here. But Kevin Hayborn is a pretty damn good guitar player and it's a real shame that he doesn't get mentioned enough when we talk about some of these guitar greats that have come out of this movement nobody ever mentions his name but yeah. terrific terrific player yeah cool right on so my number four i'm gonna pick screaming and bleeding um so this is uh september 28th 1985 again you know, I, I, I cut it off when I did those books and basically said the new age British heavy metal is, is over. I mean, a lot of people even ended in 84. Some people even be really strict and ended in 83. Um, so this is 85. No one's really paying attention anymore. I, again, they've lost their major label deal. They've already broken up and reformed. It's a little bit like the damned with machine gun etiquette, right? It's like, it's like a new era, a new band, and they have broken up. I mean, I'm not, I don't even remember if I was aware of them being gone, like completely. I, I think I was aware of them actually having been broken up. But again, um, so same sort of, uh, as you say, you know, Pete, you, you use the word murky, murky production, real buzzsaw guitar sound, but killer, killer riffs. Um, who's to blame the opener song, Ch uh, Child of the Night's amazing, Evil Games is cool. Um, there's a pop one a little bit later called Goodbye, which is kind of, they do a pretty good job of even trying to be a little more accessible. Um, but, but again, like, uh, like the, sh the ship has sailed. You know, I, I just recall, I've had this discussion with a lot of people saying that, um, you know, there were drug problems in the band and, you know, a, a lot of the, um, a lot of the, uh, the, the lineups kind of shifted a lot. And, and in the beginning, they were just a trio. So, you know, I, I've heard things that maybe they weren't that great live, although I've had that sort of, um, you know, um, disputed like they you know people who told me hey they were really good live um but uh but yeah so it's it's it was a disappointment coming back so much later like literally five years later um with the new lineup but they did still have dave hogg but uh but again um yeah a, as you say um you know i i can't off the top of my head agree with you about kevin hayborn on on uh, solos, because I can't quite remember exactly what his solos are like. I can't picture too many in, in my head, but as a riff writer, amazing. Like, there's just one of the very best riff writers of the entire New Wave of British Heavy Metal. Yeah, absolutely. It, damn good soloist, too. But, uh, man, the riffs just killer on every one of these albums. And what's, what's even crazier, and we're going to talk about them soon, is even on some of these later albums, 
wrist that could be even better than some of the early ones. So he's, yeah. he's been stocking them up for a while. Uh, all right, we're kind of going neck and neck here. Screaming and Bleeding is my number four as well. Okay. Uh, I agree with everything that Martin said. I think it's a solid record. Uh, production, not so solid, but the songs are still pretty damn good. Um, Afraid of the Dark, there's a couple tunes on here that are kind of almost borderline on like doom, right? It's Afraid of the Dark's kind of moody and proggy, slow. Uh, Waltz the Night to me is complete doom and, and done very well. I think you mentioned uh, Who's to Blame, really, really great track, very heavy, Evil Games, Child of the Night. Good album. Uh, we got a new bass player on board for this album. This is uh, David Tatum's first appearance with the band. So uh, I don't know, I like this album, it's good. Pretty interesting cover art too, which we're not showing here today, obviously, because neither yeah. one of us on it. But yeah, the cover arts are really like Black Sabbath, Born Again, yeah. Eat the Bomb, and all right, just just scary illustration and stuff. And they use the wrong who's on who's to blame. That always drove me crazy. Right? Yes, <laughs> that is true. Uh, yeah. It's funny. I remember seeing these because you know back in the day when the, these albums were coming out, uh, these were only available on imports in my red local record stores. Yeah. And you would always see they were really expensive, and you always saw these like really cool album covers. You're like, I don't know anything about these guys guys but those are pretty cool looking album covers it's got to be metal it's like you know 17.99 which back then is a lot of money for a record i'm buying it you know yeah uh... yeah <laughs> all right so my number three um i i don't have a copy but in between um you know i i looked up and played this a little more this of course is just a demos collection but this came out in between so there's a long in between period this is a 2013 album you know they obviously they haven't made an album since uh 86 right uh, there we go. A great album cover. Oh, oh yeah. just such a killer, killer album cover. Um, I don't know if that's a classic old painting or not. Obviously, it, it is on, on the, the classic album that we're going to talk about. But um, really, really cool wrist. As you say, I mean, this is this is one of the, the most shocking comeback. Probably this is the greatest comeback of a New Wave British heavy metal band that there is. I mean, Maiden kept going and Saxon did kind of a different thing and Motorhead's making good music. Diamond Head is an interesting case. There's some, some great stuff, some that's maybe not so great. But, I mean, Kevin just came back just stomping, almost like a, like a Michael Schenker comeback. Um, you know, this is, this is just a, a really masterpiece of a metal album. Um, but a, a totally different band. Um, Will Palmer on bass, Andy Prestige on drums. Uh, yeah, Dead Sea Scrolls on this one, the opener, Witching Hour, really melodic, just very, very new wave of British heavy metal. Like, there's no truck being made to modernity on this at all. It's it's literally just, um, and, and even the production is a little bit, um, you know, it's it's the reason I put this one down a little bit uh, from the other one, but it, it, the production almost sounds like, uh, it almost sounds like, they wanted to use a little bit of what they got on Screaming and Bleeding on Frontal Assault on this. It's almost like that that production was a little more deliberate than it seemed um, because it is it is just a little bit harsh and lively, um, but still, and you know, basically correct. Um, but yeah, just a, just a really, really cool album, just full of just gothic, doomy, uh, you know, great riffs. Yep. This was my comeback of 2012, actually. Uh, I remember saying that the year came out and uh, it's my number three again. Martin and I are just matching it up yeah. every single one here. Uh, yeah. One of the best kind of reunion slash comeback albums of this time period. I think it's just, it's just so such a great album. What I like about this album too, uh, you know, compared to like the first album and even the second and third, uh, those are mostly shorter songs. I mean, the band was going for like, you know, two and a half to four minutes. That was about it. Here, like everything is like four five and six minutes long, but not boring. Big, tremendous riffs. Uh, you mentioned Dead Sea Scrolls, absolutely killer. Uh, Into the Dark, The Horla. I mean, that's like total doom, Witching Hour guillotine is absolutely crushing you got uh, brainwash which is the longest track on the album finishing it all off i think um kevin sounds just like he did way back then on the vocals on the guitars i mean it's just near perfect album yeah uh, again and here we here we are ranking at number three which yeah. just goes to tell you how good the next two are right yeah exactly yeah so my number two uh, is Angel of Light 2019. So here we go. Ah, Kevin, it's, it's just, he's so bad with the timing. Yeah, there it is. And not, and not as good album cover as the last one. But still pretty good, though. Yeah, still pretty good. Um, but, uh, you know, it's just, 
the timing of this band just seemed to be a mess other than that first record that was perfect timing but then things fell apart very quickly right um yeah. but yeah to, to put out to put out an album like like screaming and bleeding in 85 and frontal and then and then go all the way to 2013 yeah very cool yeah and uh and you know and then go another six years before putting out this absolute masterpiece angel of light um new drummer they got Fred, frederick jansen in there the production on this um is is you know slightly different and slightly better a little less bright but a little more analog and just really powerful uh versus the 2013 album just perfect production but still has got some old timey values to it, right? Yeah. Uh, it's not it's not overly desktop production, you know that Andy Sneap term or computer computer production or whatever. It it just it still sounds it still sounds you know beholden to the olden, right? Uh, it's just got this really cool gothic classic sound. Like just it, it's got to be one of my favorite albums of, of 2019, and and just like. When I heard that, I just thought, okay, no, nothing this guy ever did was a mistake. The guy's a total metal genius. And so, yeah, there we go. My number two. He is. Yeah, it's also my number two. And this was a top 10 album of the year for me. And I agree with you. It's like, I think if you, if you closed your eyes and someone played this for you and said, it's Angel Witch, how do you like it? You probably wouldn't, it wouldn't be too hard to say, you know what, is that like, a long lost album from like 82 or something like that because other than it's got a little bit of a cleaner production based on some of the other ones other than that i mean it's it's totally from that era it's yeah. just like it's like it came from a time machine from 81 or 82 dropped in our laps in 2019 some just great great dramatic songs on here uh the night is calling uh condemned and i am in for me real doomy real gothic sounding yeah. death from andromeda don't turn your back i mean the entire yeah. album is just kick ass and uh and they find themselves you know metal blade records here for these which is a good place to be right yeah and uh which is surprising because you mentioned how they never seem to be in the right place at the right time yeah so why and i'm gonna have to ask brian slagle this next time i talk to him so why wasn't this album like pushed to the moon because it deserved to be yeah it's that damn, that damn good yeah, and, there, and there's, a, there's a lot of dodgy new wave of British heavy metal lineups and reunions and albums. I yeah. mean, Tigers of Pantang is, is pretty darn compromised. You know, Holocaust did some interesting things later, and Savage was a pretty good band, and Raven's been consistent. But, you know, there's, you know, there's, a, there's a lot of these things where they just kind of get back together and they don't really have the songs. And even, even Samson kind of went downhill in the late 80s. So, you know, it, you could be pretty skeptical knowing that you know the massive lineup changes and and the real sort of uh you know cheap rawness of the 85 and the 86 album but i mean there's no reason to be skeptical at all i mean these were just incredible albums these two that kevin put out and and what a singer eh? his voice it, it's really cool that he is the singer because yeah i mean you need him as the vocalist i mean in the in the early days they were just a trio and it was it was him so he's a massive part of the personality so it, it's incredible that uh, that it is him singing on music. He's the voice and he's the guitar hero of the band. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Not, not that easy to do both, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So my number one is um, the debut. Um, you know, there it is behind me, the vinyl. Uh, I, I have always maintained um, this is probably my favorite. You know, we're going to do a show on the favorite new wave of British heavy metal albums. Um, if I don't pick it first, it'll probably be second or third. I mean, it's absolutely... Um, one of the top new wave of British heavy metal albums. I've always maintained, uh, I'll argue with anybody, um, but you know, in the great battle between Iron Maiden and Angel Witch, Angel Witch was the victor in 1980, but Iron Maiden quickly took off and, yeah. and got much better fast. And then we had Killers and Number of the Beast and Peace of Mind and Angel Witch was literally not even around. They were disappeared for that whole period. They were not, they had no albums let alone good albums, right? But in 1980, this is a better album than the first Iron Maiden album. They were actually more professional, greater songwriting, greater production, greater charm, everything about it. This is so doomy. I mean, you know, when we talk about the first Doom albums, uh, past Black Sabbath, I always, you know, maintain Witchfinder General is the first Doom band. They're a late new wave British heavy metal band, right? But this album comes into the... Um, 
discussion sometimes as well, because it's pretty doomy as well with Atlantis and Confused and Angel of Death. Um, just a masterpiece start to finish. It's on, it's on EMI, right? Um, you know, so they're on, they're on a, a major label. Um, yeah, an absolute uh, classic. I, I, I think there was probably no surprise that that was going to be our, our number one. And like I say, early, it's in the very first year of the new wave of British heavy metal proper. And, uh, and it's just killing all the competition by being this crazy, evil, scary band. Yeah. And, and you know, there's a reason why this album is so beloved by so many people. Um, and what I love about it too, it's so melodic, right? Mm -hmm. Like almost every song on here is like a real catchy anthem, despite it yep. being so heavy. Um, and the songs are compact. They don't overstay their welcome. I mean, this album, do I, what is this album, 35 minutes long? Yeah, not sure. Something like that, right? It's just like it kind of comes, it kicks your ass, knocks your teeth in, and then it's gone. Yeah. Right? So uh, just like early speed metal stuff is on here. Early Doom is on here. Again, this is not like Black Sabbath Doom. This is a little bit different. And just so many great songs. You mentioned, uh, you know, the title track, Angel, which is so catchy. Atlantis is great. You got that heavy bass grooves of uh, White Witch. Yeah. Um, Sorceress is great. I love the little kind of thin Lizzy influences on Gorgon. You know, you got uh, Freeman has just an absolutely ridiculously killer uh, guitar solo from Mr. Hayborn. I just, it's a great album. It's a, just yeah. a, start to finish. I mean, there's no weak point on it at all. And the other cool thing about it is, is surrounding it, you did have Baphomet from Metal from Others. You had Flight 19, amazing, amazing, uh, you know, B-side that's added on to stuff. But, but the singles with the, with the um, you know, the devil on the cover. There's a bunch of them, yeah. Hades that's Paradise. The heck out of you, right? And then, yeah, and then Hades Paradise as well. Loser. Extermination Day on another sampler. Uh, so, so yeah, I remember now, uh, like the only thing we got from Angel Witch after this was the Loser Supper Dr. Right. Fives single. I, I have that actually, I should have pulled that out, but, and, and it was a bit of a disappointment. It was a step down from the album, um, but it was still pretty catchy and pretty skilled songwriting. Right. And then they just disappeared. Right. And I guess I, I don't know how soon the breakup came, but, uh, but they were gone after that. Um, so, you know, essentially right around that time, you did get a good album and a half of, uh, of Angel Witch. So that was cool. You have to wonder, even with the breakup that took them, you know, basically four years to kind of come back and put something else out. Cut that in half. You think they make more of a statement? And Yeah. Uh, yeah, they would have been amazing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's a shame. Uh, the, those big what ifs we talk about in hard rock and metal, there's so many of them. Yeah. But, the uh, career thing, right? Having all your ducks in a row, having a great manager. I mean, you compare them to Iron Maiden and the stories are just so, they're so divergent, right? And Iron Maiden makes an album that's maybe a little worse than the Angel Witch album, but the next one's probably better. Killers is maybe even a better album than the Angel Witch album. The Number of the Beast and Peace of Mind. And all of a sudden it's like one just goes 100, 100 miles straight up, you know, 100 miles an hour uh, to quote Vardis. <laughs> and, uh, and the other one just kind of kind of like limps off and goes away and what could have been, right? Yeah, yeah, so it's it, a shame. Well, you know. the important thing is they're releasing some pretty killer albums these days yeah. and arguably their newer albums could be better than anything Maiden's put out in a while. That's right? actually true. You know, I, I'll, <laughs> I'll, go, I'll go on the, uh, even though I've written Iron Maiden books and I just had, had one come out with those latest albums. I mean, I would say... I, I like those fully. latest albums, but man, yeah. these, these two Angel yeah, Witch these albums? are better. They're better, yeah, man. Hell yeah. they're, they're better again. So, so Kevin gets the last laugh. His last two albums are better than any Maiden album since the early days. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's kind of the truth. And, and that's, you know, for some of you who are huge Maiden fans, you're like, no way. Well, yes way. That's how good <laughs> these albums are. Yeah. So uh, we're not slagging the Maiden albums because they're fine too. But man, these are these two albums here. These are the ones we're talking about, folks, right here. What did say? 2012 and 2019? Yeah, Go and check them out if you haven't. I'm telling you. Really good. So there we have it. Ranking the studio catalog of Angel Witch. This was fun, Martin. And guess what? We're going to do this all over again in uh, next week. Yep. So just so you all know, this is what we're cooking for next week. Uh, Martin and I have or we, we tasked ourselves with going into the vast number of releases of so many really cool bands in the history of the new wave of British heavy metal. But we're only doing, what, 80 to 84? Is that what we said? Yeah, yeah, basically whatever you, th you know, either of us think the new wave of British hard metal is, and that's kind of what I, I sort of figured out. Yeah, so we're, to, we're gonna go back, or really. and mm -hmm. we're each gonna pick out our 10 favorite new wave of yeah. British heavy metal albums from that time period. So again, you know, all these great bands are uh, 
you know, their albums were up for the challenge. So we're talking Angel Witch and Satan and Iron Maiden and Saxon, Def Leppard, Demon, uh, Savage. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. So, a very interesting thing is going to happen because as, as I was telling Pete, uh, my next episode of History and Five Songs with Martin Popoff is called uh, Problem with Top New Album. So Problem with Top New Wave of British Heavy Metal because um, there's, there's, three di there's three problems I find with, with ranking your top 10. And in that episode, which comes out next Tuesday, so it'll be before we do this, I talk about the big, big problem. And I mentioned the problem came up because of going on, on the show. You know, like, like, how do you pick 10? Because you could go a really, really radical 10 that would blow people's minds, but it is actually quite valid. So we'll talk about that and, and, uh, and why, you know, you, you might want to do a compromise. So, so when you pick 10, it, there's a really, really interesting problem of picking 10 and, and, uh, and we'll bring that to light. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's a, there's certain bands that should, do they belong? Do they not belong? And yeah. some bands have a couple of really great albums. And do you fill up your top 10 with four or five releases from the same band? Does Venom belong? Does Motorhead belong? Does Gillen belong? I mean, it's just, it just gets exactly. a little crazy, yeah. right? And how about, does it have to be from Britain? Because there's certain bands that are from other countries. I'm thinking, was it Praying Mantis? They're not from, they're not from a British band. So well, did people, they... people put Accept and the famous one is yeah. ES band, you know, and there's, there's a few Swedish ones and there's a few French ones that kind of fit in. And... Merciful Fate. I mean, all, it's like, you know, do you count any of them? I, I don't know. They're all right. They're all from this. They're all European bands. They're all from the same time period, but... Yeah, I mean, I, I won't go that far and go out of Britain for it, but that is one of the problems. And then, and then, yeah, there's the Gillen, there's the Motorhead problem, there's the Priest problem. You yeah. know, a lot of people talk about Priest as part of this too, right? Sometimes. Right? Uh, I so. don't know. I I kind of think, for me anyway, and we, and we can get more into this next week, but yeah. I think Priest just kind of predates all this way too much, like for too many years. And I think Motorhead too is kind of they're kind of right on the cusp there as well. You know, Venom is a different story, I think, but uh, I don't know. Yeah, that Motorhead one, we, we have that debate a lot with people. I'm pretty squarely in the camp of, yeah, Motorhead absolutely belongs, but I do, I do see why people exclude them, right? There are, there are two. Well, Overkill, Overkill is what year? 79, Overkill is uh, early 79, Bomber is late 79, yeah. Motorhead is 77, Lemmy's an old guy, he goes back to Sam Gopal and he goes to, and he's Hawkwind and they don't sound exactly right, but they're like, they're like literally, on the other end of it, they're like one of the top three bands you think of when you think of New Wave British Heavy Metal sometimes, Motorhead, Saxon, Iron Maiden, right? And arguably you could say that they started it all. Yeah, and they're, and they're and they're participating in a big way. This is the other thing I always say: Do you do you put out a ton of singles, picture sleeve singles? Do you put out a bunch of singles with B sides? Are you touring with all those bands? Like, I mean, come on, Ace of Spades, the live album, all of those singles, touring with Girl School. They're so they're so knee you know knees deep into the thing that you got to include them, right? Yeah. So yeah, I wouldn't argue it. That's, yeah. You know. Yeah, it'll be fun one, so. Yeah, exactly. Cool. So there you have it, everybody. Uh, top, rank of the top, rank, rank of the studio albums. I'm already, I'm already thinking about the, the, the show we're doing next weekend. Rank in the, uh, rank in the studio albums, Angel Witch. This is on the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter. Of course, we're here on the YouTube all the damn time. Thanks for sticking with us uh, here late in the day on Friday. We had hoped to bring this to you early in the morning, but uh, I got... Uh, we had a power outage for about 15 hours here where I live in New York and uh, I was incommunicado this morning till uh, just about lunchtime with no power since eight o'clock yesterday. So Martin was a trooper to kind of hang in there and make himself available late in the day here today. So yeah, uh, very cool. Glad we got her done. Exactly. So everybody have a great weekend and uh, we'll see you all Sunday night. I'll be back Sunday night and then Martin, we'll see you next week, my friend. Okay. Sounds good. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.